Today we're talking about mastering the art of effective feedback. And in our leads in a caring environment domains, this topic falls under engage others and specifically in the subdomain of foster the development of others. But it also falls under lead self and achieve results to some extent because being able to give and receive feedback effectively is actually very important to success. And for today's session, we're considering feedback in the context of working with a, a team in a clinic um, or being a member of a board or a committee. But honestly, these principles are pretty universal. So they can be applied even when thinking about maintaining family harmony, for example. And we're gonna focus mainly on giving feedback to others, but we'll also touch on how to receive it effectively. All right, so getting started with uh, giving feedback. And um, as we <laughs> first start to talk about the early aspects of this, there are a few typical approaches that people use to giving feedback. And the first is indirect. So when feedback is given in a very soft and perhaps vague way, and in many cases, the recipient doesn't actually register that feedback is being given or is maybe just left confused. And then on the other end of the spectrum is too direct feedback. So this approach will often trigger defensiveness in the person uh, and the recipient won't even actually be able to hear or receive that feedback. They won't be open to it. And then there's the approach of avoiding giving feedback. And so the person keeps whatever it is to themselves and avoids any unpleasantness. And then of course the risk here is that resentment and frustration can grow and the non-recipient loses out on an opportunity to grow and learn. So what we're shooting for is effective feedback that is minim minimally painful for both parties uh, and does result in growth and learning and ultimately in improved relationships. Here we are back at our, our brain that we've seen so many times. We've talked about this a lot. And once again, our limbic system is strongly at play when it comes to giving feedback. So as a very quick review, the limbic system is that primitive part of our brain where threats are perceived. And its goal is to keep us safe and it is the center of emotion. And it houses the amygdala, where you may have heard of um, the term amygdala hijack. And that's what happens when our limbic system perceives a, a significant threat and then throws us into survival mode. And our prefrontal cortex is the center of our higher level thinking and where we regulate the emotion and modulate those alarm bells that the limbic system raises. Again, in our modern lives, that, you know, that mountain lion we face would be considered, uh, that is often that significant threat, is more social now. It's often a person. Uh, so our limbic system, though, still sees it as a life and death situation and sends us into that survival mode by responding with fight, fight flight, freeze, or as we've talked about in the past, the new one that's been added is fawn, meaning saying or doing anything to get out of the threat situation. And in this case, maybe not giving feedback when it is warranted or giving soft feedback in order just to get out of the situation. We also previously talked about the five primordial fears that we all face that Dr. Carl Albrecht describes in this hierarchy on the screen here. And receiving feedback definitely can trigger these top three aspects of the pyramid. So fear of ego death, which often looks like shame and humiliation, fear of separation, which is related to being rejected or abandoned, and fear of loss of autonomy, which is about feeling restricted or controlled. And again, our primitive brains tend to be very dramatic. So case in point, neuroscientist uh, Dr. David Rock has said that hearing the words, can I give you some feedback, creates the same response in our brain as walking down a dark alley and hearing footsteps behind you. So it's actually very threatening to our brains. 
So how can we approach giving feedback in a way that won't trigger the limbic system to go into survival mode? Because once a person is triggered, we know that they're not open or responsive, their creativity in their brain shuts down, and they really won't likely get anything helpful out of the encounter. And that's always the goal of giving feedback. Now, one thing to consider is we're continually wanting to build the psychological safety in a group culture, whether it's a clinic team, a board, or again, even a family. So we've talked about this in the past also. Psychological safety is when you feel safe to share thoughts and opinions or admit to mistakes that have been made or give someone feedback, knowing that they won't meet that with anger or ridicule or other negative consequences. So when psychological safety is strong in a group, giving and receiving feedback is much easier. And when we provide and receive feedback in a thoughtful way, we build psychological safety. So it's, it's really a cyclical process. And in general, when it's delivered well, feedback is really a gift. So another thing to consider, everyone has heard about the you know, proverbial sandwich um, where you position that feedback between two compliments. And in theory, this makes sense, but there are actually some issues with it. And the first one is that a lot of people know about it now. So they might find it manipulative or con condescending when they realize the sandwich they're being fed. Um, and then there's a group of people who will only hear the compliments and will completely miss the cleverly padded feedback. And then another personality type will only hear the feedback and may think that it's worse than it is because it was so heavily sugar-coated. So we may actually want to avoid this approach. Instead, though, we're going to look at a five-step formula for providing feedback that's designed to really avoid triggering the amygdala in the recipient. And that is really the goal. If it's going to be effective at all, the person has to be open to receiving it. So step one is to let the person know that you have some feedback to share and ask them permission to share it. This way, the person isn't blindsided and can kind of prepare mentally to receive that feedback. And giving them the option of not hearing the feedback or you know, if it's critical that they hear it, the option of when they hear the feedback gives them a sense of control. And remember that primordial fear related to loss of autonomy. So they're making sure that they still feel that sense of control. And so on our slide, our, our uh, feedback giver is saying, I have a perspective I'd like to share with you about X. Would you like to hear it now? Or is there a better time for you? It's very simple. Step two then is to let them know that your intention is good. You want to support them in being successful, not punish or scold them. And again, the two top primordial fears are related to being shamed and rejected. So making it clear that it's not going to happen is important to keep the limbic system from going into survival mode and the feedback then falling on deaf ears. So our, our feedback giver says, I'm sharing this with you because I value you as part of the team and I want to support your success. In step three, we get specific and objective about what the behavior is that has been observed. And it's important not to imply that it's related to the person's innate character. Just be specific and objective about what you saw or heard. And again, our person is saying, this is what I've observed and then would spell it out. So another tip is to avoid words that aren't objective. And specifically what cognitive psychologist Leanne Renninger calls blur words. So these are words that can mean different things to different people so that the feedback uh, recipient may find it difficult to pinpoint what to keep doing or stop doing in the future. So here are a couple of ex examples. So a blurry example would be, I'm concerned that you're just not showing up. And that could mean different things to different people. A more clear version of that would be, in the past month, you've been over 30 minutes late on five occasions. So again, that's very clear and objective. Another example, I'm concerned about your level of participation in board meetings. 
again, level of participation could be a little blurry to people, versus at the last three meetings, you expressed opinions or feedback on only two of 10 topics. So again, very clear and objective. And this level of specificity is also helpful when giving positive feedback. So talking about what someone is doing well, not just great job, but specifics like I really appreciated how you um, came to me with options for solutions, not just a problem. And another thing to avoid is implicating others in feedback. So when someone hears that others have been talking about them, they'll very quickly feel that primordial fear and their limbic system will kick in, meaning that, again, they won't be able to listen openly or objectively or think creatively. And it also builds distrust and erodes the psychological safety in the group. So it's best to keep feedback to what you've personally observed whenever possible. Again, on our slide, you can it says, I'm hearing from others that you do X. And so that can really um, lead to some in, unintended issues. So back to our five steps. Step four is about spelling out the natural consequences of the behavior. So the impact that it has or has had from your perspective. And this really helps to connect the logic. So our, our feedback giver on the slide is saying, on the days that you're late, I get behind and can't catch up. Patients are kept waiting and get frustrated. So again, spelling out what the consequences of the behavior are. And in the example of the board, uh, the recipient giver says, without your, your, without your unique perspective in board discussions, we may not be making the most informed decisions. All right, in our final step, we wrap up the feedback with a request for what would be preferred behavior moving forward. So making it really clear for the recipient and then finishing with a question that invites discussion and creates, or, or invites discussion and creative uh, problem solving. So a statement and a question like, this is what I'm thinking should happen next time, but what are your thoughts on it? Creates commitment, not just compliance. And then it becomes more of a joint problem solving conversation. So a couple little tips to keep in mind when using these five steps. Um, performance feedback should ideally be given as soon as possible after an event or that behavior occurs, and especially if behavior change is the ultimate goal. And actually, the same holds true for giving positive feedback. When you want to reinforce the right behavior, it's most meaningful when it's delivered in a very timely way, so as close to the event as possible. And speaking of positive reinforcement, the most effective feedback is praise. So highlighting what a person is doing right encourages more of it. And it's especially important to include how that person's work contributes in the big picture so they can see how their work is, is making a difference. Now, according to Gallup, praise is like espresso. It's uplifting and invigorating, and it helps people to believe in their own abilities, and it motivates them to take on more difficult tasks. But one thing to note about that is that people prefer their praise and recognition in different forms. So it can be helpful to ask you know, ahead of time if they like to be recognized one-on-one, -on -one, if they like to be recognized in front of the rest of the team in a group setting, uh, if they prefer in writing or some other method. So as a leader, it's important to take a moment to find out how people actually like to receive their praise. All right, now when we're on the receiving end of feedback, it's also helpful to avoid the amygdala hijack so that we can be open to it and use it to improve. Um, because of course, none of us is perfect, and even though we may try, but uh, we all can benefit from getting feedback and then and actually receiving it, incorporating it and using it uh, to improve ourselves. So as we discussed earlier, the risk when someone gives us feedback is that our limbic system is immediately triggered and we fight, flee, freeze or fawn and we miss out on the gift that may be found in that feedback. So to prevent that, 
we need to immediately engage our prefrontal cortex. And we can do this by kind of detaching, detaching ourselves and getting curious about the information that's being shared. So really think about it as viewing the situation clinically. What about this is true? What about this feedback is off base? And then consider how this insight can help us to become better at what we do or who we are in the world. So really just sort of stepping back and then trying to find the gift in the feedback. And that can help keep us from going into that amygdala hijack state. Now we know giving feedback can be stressful for the deliverer. So to help with that psychological safety, it helps if your first response is to thank them. So um, you can see here, if the feedback isn't sitting well with you and you feel yourself slipping into that survival mode, it's better to ask for some time to consider before responding. There's um, less risk of saying or doing something regrettable. And it's important to keep in mind that perfection is an unrealistic expectation for others and especially of ourselves, but we can always get better. So again, trying to really view any feedback as a gift. And again, I'm aware some people are driving, so I'll just read the, the receiver of the uh, feedback on the screen is saying, thank you for this feedback, I appreciate it. Uh, I need some time to think about it before I respond. I'll get back to you on this soon. So again, whatever you need to keep yourself from going into amygdala hijack. Now, according to Stanford professor Carol Dweck, who wrote a very popular book called Mindset, um, it describes that people see their qualities as, um, some people see their qualities as fixed traits that can't be changed. And so they're described as having a fixed mindset. Whereas people with a growth mindset feel that their skills and intelligence can be improved with effort and persistence. And they embrace challenges and persist through obstacles. And they learn from criticism and feedback. And they actually seek out inspiration uh, from others' success. So someone with a growth mindset views intelligence, abilities, and talents as learnable and capable of improving through effort. And on the other hand, someone with a fixed mindset views these same traits as inherently stable and unchangeable over time. So one of the best ways to seek growth opportunities and to avoid being triggered by feedback is to ask for it. So Marshall uh, Goldsmith's approach is called feed forward. And basically you're pulling regular feedback instead of waiting for it or in some cases, avoiding it at all costs. So feed forward involves choosing a behavior that you'd like to work on. And in the example on the screen, it's being a better listener. Then select a few people that you trust and ask them if they have any suggestions for you in the future. And this is important. Talking about mistakes of the past is likely to trigger your limbic system. And so that's not helpful. And then, make sure you thank that person for sharing their ideas with you. So if it's a positive experience for them, they're more likely to do it again for you. And even better, they may ask for feed forward themselves. And this is the kind of behavior modeling that continual learners and great leaders uh, often demonstrate. If you have kids, one of the best things you can do is instill in them the idea of yet. So we all have the ability to learn and get better. There, there really are a few limits, but we need to believe that we can get better, that we can learn. And when we do believe, it's easier to see feedback as helpful to get better faster instead of criticism of our fixed abilities. So again, in, on the screen, she's saying, I'm not great at it yet but I'm learning. So again, adding that yet to the end of sentences uh, really helps to remind us of having that growth mindset. All right, so that concludes the presentation portion of our session.